My insane neighbor crashed my disabled son's birthday party, so I turned everyone in the whole town against him. My son's birthday party was in full swing when my middle-aged neighbor Frank showed up uninvited. He said he had a gift for my son, and despite my better judgment I let him in. When he walked in he plopped down onto the couch and put his shoes on the table of snacks, before taking out a beer. My son came over to me, Mom what's he doing here? I don't know honey, he said he had a present and promised to stay only for a few. I realized Frank being here was ruining my son's birthday, and my son is in a wheelchair, this is his 21st birthday, and I'd be damned if it gets ruined. I walked over to Frank, but he stood up and just walked by me. He went up to my son, and since he was a little tipsy, joked that my son at least always has a seat. I rushed back to Frank, but before I reached him he lost his balance and tripped. He bumped into my son's wheelchair and knocked him over. It took everything in me not to lose it on him and cause a scene, but I kicked him out immediately. I comforted my son and he said everything was fine, but his eyes were watery. That Frank had ruined my son Michael's day, and I wasn't going to let it slide. My son started tearing up and crying out of nowhere, so I knew I had to call it a day. I went out to tell our friends and family members goodbye and apologized for the inconvenience. The next day, I was still burning with rage and plotted what I was going to do to Frank. I decided to go ahead and do some grocery shopping to ease my nerves, and that's when I saw him. It was Frank. He was in the dairy aisle as I was trying to get some cheese. I walked past him, and he noticed me giving him the nastiest look. Frank returned a smirk. This made me even more angry. He tried to make conversation with me. Morning. You look like you could use a drink. Lighten up a bit. He mocked. My blood boiled just from the sound of his voice, but I chose to remain quiet. What I had in store for him would do the talking for me. I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of a reaction. Frank would never see it coming. That night as Michael slept, I sat in the living room plotting. As I was trying to get my plan together, I found myself struggling to focus. I heard loud country music playing outside. I opened my blinds to see the house next to me lit up on the inside. It was the source of the music. Frank's house. Right then I felt the light bulb flicker on in my head. My first move would be simple. I reported Frank's loud music and barking dog to the homeowners association. It wasn't much, but it was a start. Frank received a warning and was told to keep his dog inside during the night, and though it didn't seem to face him at first, I noticed that he began to pay more attention when I was around. But Frank wasn't one to take things lying down. A few days after the warning, I woke up to find Frank's trash can stumped on my driveway. The garbage was strewn around as if he was trying to send a message. I was ticked off as I found spoiled milk and sludge that looked like it could have been a corn casserole once, but I cleaned up the mess the best I could. The grass was still covered with questionable liquids, and the stink that it brought made my eyes water. I knew that he wouldn't let up so I decided to up the ante. Since he wanted to throw his trash all over my yard, I'd start talking trash about him. I talked to multiple people about Frank being a troublemaker, and I subtly slipped the idea into conversations with my neighbors. I told them about the birthday party and stressed how Frank had shown up uninvited and proceeded to ruin the entire party with his jokes about Michael's wheelchair. I told them how he killed the mood of the whole party by literally knocking Michael out of his wheelchair, and when I saw the concerned looks on my other neighbors' faces, I felt really satisfied inside. I tried to hide my facial expressions and continued in the sad story. I then casually brought up the trash can situation, and that's when one mentioned that they smelled it from across the street and they wondered who I ticked off to do such a thing. I could see the uneasiness growing on their faces as I revealed it was Frank. The more I talked, the more I could tell that they thought Frank was nothing but trouble, and he was. I told them the truth, and my plan was working. They began telling the rest of the neighbors, and they all sided with me. Soon, people were avoiding him, crossing the street when they saw him coming, and giving him suspicious looks. I could see them start to distance themselves from Frank, and it was satisfying to see him begin to become isolated. One afternoon I assumed that word had gotten back to Frank about what I said because as I was pulling into my driveway, I saw Frank backing out of his, deliberately scuffing Michael's wheelchair ramp with his car. I jumped out of my car, ran over to his and kicked it. He rolled his window down, yelled at me, and asked what I was doing. I asked him why he hit my son's wheelchair ramp, and he shrugged and told me that I needed to keep my feet off his vehicle if I knew what was best for me. He then floored the gas, nearly hitting me and the sound of his motor roared as he sped off. I was beyond ticked off, my urge to follow him was overwhelming, but I knew that losing my temper would only give Frank more ammunition. Instead, I turned and walked back to my house, but my heart was racing. I felt adrenaline pulse through my veins as I plotted my next move. That night, I decided to take things further. I spent hours on my computer, digging into Frank's life. It didn't take long before I found a few social media profiles that seemed to match his age and location. One of the profiles listed a company name. It was a local construction firm where Frank apparently worked. Bingo. I clicked through and gathered as much information as I could. The company's website had a section with a list of employees and their contact information. I couldn't believe my luck when I saw Frank's name listed under the project manager's section, along with a work email address. I drafted a few anonymous emails using realistic-looking burner email accounts that I quickly created. The messages were worded carefully, just vague enough to sound like they could be from a concerned coworker or client. I mentioned unprofessional behavior and inappropriate conduct in the workplace, 
hinting that Frank had been making others uncomfortable and that it might be worth looking into. I didn't make any direct accusations, just enough to plant a seed of doubt in his boss's mind. I knew that in a company like this, even a hint of misconduct could trigger an internal investigation, especially if it was framed as a potential liability issue. I sent the emails to Frank's boss and a couple of other higher-ups in the company, making sure they'd all see it. As I clicked send on the last email, I felt a rush of adrenaline. I knew I was taking a risk, but I didn't care. Frank had pushed me to this point, and now he was going to face the consequences. I sat back, slightly nervous but satisfied. The next morning, I watched from the window as Frank left for work. His usual confidence was gone. He looked tense and hurried to his car, papers falling out of his work folder as he rushed. I knew something had happened, maybe his boss had already called him, maybe he'd been questioned. Whatever it was it was working. Frank had been shaken, and that was exactly what I wanted. When Frank came home that evening, you could basically see the steam coming out of his ears. He stormed into his house and slammed the door behind him. He knew I was targeting him. I was in the kitchen making breakfast while Michael went out to grab the mail. A couple of minutes passed, and I didn't hear him come back right away. There was this weird silence that made my heart skip a beat. I called out to him, asking if everything was okay, but all I got back was this uneasy quiet. I rushed to the front hall, and then I saw him. Michael was on the porch holding the mail, but he looked off. His face was pale. That's when I noticed this crumpled piece of paper mixed in with the envelopes. When I asked him what was wrong, Michael didn't say anything at first. He just handed me the note, and I could see how scared he was. My heart dropped as I unfolded it and read the words, You think you can get away with this? Watch your back, Beach. It's not over. It was like a punch to the gut. I knew immediately this was from Frank. My blood was boiling. Michael looked at me, and I could see the fear in his eyes. He's tough, but this was too much. He asked me what I was going to do and if Frank would hurt us. Hearing him say that shattered me but I couldn't let him see how scared I was. I had to be strong for both of us. I hugged him tight and told him that it was all going to be okay. I promised him that we were going to get through this and that I wasn't going to let anything happen to him. I crumpled the note in my hand. Frank had crossed a line, and now it was personal. I told Michael we'd take steps to protect ourselves and that we'd do whatever it took to stay safe. But inside, I knew I had to do more. Over the next few days, Frank began leaving more threatening notes in my mailbox, each one more menacing than the last. He also spray-painted graffiti on my fence, calling me a crazy beach in red and black letters. The sight of it made Michael's heart race with fear, and he turned to me and suggested that we call the police. I could tell that he felt it was getting out of hand, but I was sure that I could handle it. That day, I installed security cameras around the house, capturing every move Frank made. I also started keeping a bat by the front door, ready for anything that could come our way. Frank's harassment continued, but this time he was on tape. One night, I woke up to the sound of my car alarm going off. I looked outside my window and saw my car tires being slashed. The next morning, me and Michael were stranded. I planned to take him to his physical therapy appointment that day and try to find anyone else who could take him so he wouldn't be late. I also found more trash on my lawn. I took a bag of Frank's trash that he had left scattered and dumped it back on his porch. I added a note that read, keep your poop to yourself. The next night, a loud crash echoed throughout the house then a sound of breaking glass. I jumped out of bed. My heart pounded as I raced to Michael's room. He was sitting up in bed, his eyes wide with fear. He asked me what that noise was, and I choked up as I realized what had happened. Frank had thrown a rock through our window and shattered it into a thousand pieces. I grabbed the bat from by the door and called the police, but by the time they arrived, Frank was long gone, having left no evidence behind. The neighborhood was in shock. People whispered about my feud with Frank, but no one seemed to know how to stop it. I felt like I was living in a nightmare, but I refused to give in. I refused to let Frank win. One evening, Frank showed up at my house. He was clearly intoxicated. His eyes were bloodshot, and his movements erratic. He banged on the door, demanding to be let in, claiming he just wanted to talk. My heart pounded through my chest as I told Michael to hide in his room. I picked up the phone and called the police, but Frank wasn't waiting around. He started trying to force the door open. His shouts got louder and more desperate. Sarah, open this damn door. I know you're in there. He screamed. Through the tears, I managed to make it to the living room to grab the bat. I stood by the door, ready to defend my home if Frank managed to break through. Stay back Frank, I shouted back. But Frank was beyond reasoning. He pounded against the door when he managed to break it. He reached around for the doorknob, and that's when I hit his hand. His knuckles were pouring red and had split from punching the door. He stopped trying to use his hand and began kicking the door down. I begged him to stop, and Michael came to the living room to help me. And just as he began to kick the door in, the sound of police sirens rang in my ears. The flashing lights were shown throughout the neighborhood in red and blue as the police arrived. Frank turned around and found an officer pulling him away from the door before he could do any more harm. As Frank was arrested, I held Michael tightly. My whole body shook. The neighborhood was buzzing with the news, and they came out to check on me and Michael. As Frank was driven away in the police car, me and Michael watched from the window, knowing they had finally put an end to the nightmare.